everybody, my name is Markiplier, and welcome to Five Nights at Freddy's. And that's Five Nights at Freddy's. Let me stop it right when the sound stops here. The scariest game of all creation. Hey everybody, today I want to talk to you guys about Five Nights at Freddy's. What's up YouTube, what's going on? Corey Kinchin here, and welcome to Five Nights at Freddy's. No, this isn't going to be a good time. Kudos to the guy who's made this horror game seriously. Hello? Uh, hello, hello, hello. Um, if you're hearing this, that means that you beat 5020 mode, and I have to do an interview now. <laughs> I, I, I was gonna try and keep it going for a while, but. DJ Stir. He is an incredible, I would almost call him a speedrunner of Five Nights at Freddy's games. Hello, everybody. My name is Markiplier, and welcome back to Five Nights at Freddy's. Oh! Oh, yeah! Let's go! Music Man! Today, the day I'm uploading this video, is Five Nights at Freddy's 8th birthday. Five Nights at Freddy's has been around for 8 years, which means there's actually fans of the franchise that are as old as the games are. Which is crazy to think about. <laughs> Even though I was 14 when FNAF began, I've been along this ride since basically the beginning. And I thought it'd be pretty cool to bring a few of my friends on this video to help share their stories about FNAF and how they first found the games and how the games have impacted their lives. So this is kind of a double video. You get the entire history of FNAF, but also a major collab between a bunch of FNAF YouTubers telling their stories about the franchise along the way. So without further ado, let's get into the entire history of Five Nights at Freddy's. And this story doesn't begin where you may think. FNAF may have been released in 2014, but its true beginning goes all the way back to December 29th, 2013, when Chipper and Sons Lumber Co. was released by Scott Cawthon. After creating various animations and RPG games such as The Desolate Hope, The Desolate Room, and Eye for Moon for many years beforehand, Scott Cawthon decided his next game was going to be Chipper and Sons Lumber Co. The game centers around a beaver, who is just starting to get into the lumber business. And the game came with mixed reviews, with reviewers stating that the characters in the game looked creepy and resembled animatronic dolls. The game itself doesn't have much to do with FNAF, it's these reviews that really sparked the idea that would later be known as Five Nights at Freddy's. Scott wasn't all for making FNAF right away, he actually had to choose between three games. He decided he wanted to give game making one last try before he moved on to a different career. He was deciding between quote, a sequel to Desolate Hope, a remake of my first game, Legacy of Flan, or a new idea about animatronics and security cameras. Receiving negative reviews on something you worked hard on is not fun and can be very demotivating, but Scott eventually decided to embrace the reviews and try his hand at making a horror game based around creepy animatronic dolls and security cameras. This is how FNAF was born. We don't know much about Scott's process while making the first FNAF game, but we do know some things that he hid in the newspapers in Five Nights at Freddy's 3. In the blurred text on the side, Scott revealed that Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy were just placeholder names while he was creating the game, and that he slowly fell in love with the names as he continued production. We also learned that Scott modeled Foxy while in the car on a 14-hour trip to visit his in-laws in the summer of 2014. He said, quote, it's very difficult to model a 3D character on a bumpy car ride. Maybe this is why Foxy looks so torn up. While we were visiting, my kids got to experience Foxy's jump scare for the first time. He also said, quote, in real life, I tend to have waking nightmares, meaning that I walk in my sleep, etc. One night, I dreamt that Bonnie was in the hall outside my door. As I jumped out of bed and rushed to hold the door shut, I discovered that the door was locked and it filled me with dread. In FNAF 1, when the doors don't work, it means something is already in your office. So when I felt that the door was locked, I felt like Bonnie was in my bedroom and was about to get me. Thankfully, I woke up. Scott also revealed that he started a crowdfunding campaign for the first FNAF game and raised a whopping zero dollars. He continued saying, quote, in the original game, Freddy was never originally meant to move around the diner and was only meant to get you if your time ran out. This was changed before release. Scott loved interacting with fans, but was otherwise a very private man. So these short paragraphs hidden in the newspaper of FNAF 3 were a welcome surprise to a community that was hungry for as much info about the series as possible. On June 14th, 2014, less than two months before the game's release, Scott Cawthon uploaded the official gameplay trailer for Five Nights at Freddy's to his YouTube channel simply titled Five Nights at Freddy's. There are rumors that Scott uploaded a slightly different trailer before this one that was removed featuring an endoskeleton with sharper teeth, but Scott never has officially confirmed that was the case. One of the most notable things in the trailer is the fact that Bonnie is seen running down the left hallway and not Foxy. This was later changed during the development process. Another notable thing is the 
ending scene where you see Bonnie ripping off his face. It's possible Bonnie originally had a bigger role to play in the game, or Scott just featured the character more because he personally thought that Bonnie was the creepiest. One month later, on July 13th, an official gameplay video of FNAF appeared on Scott Cawthon's YouTube channel. The video is only two minutes and contains gameplay from Night 5. One interesting thing to note is at the beginning of the night, you can see a sprite of a person with the number one next to them, indicating that there possibly used to be a set number of lives you would be awarded at the beginning of the game slash night. This was later taken out of the game. The first Five Nights at Freddy's game was officially coming into its final form, ready for its official release, and about to start an eight year long journey of everything from Purple Guy to Fazgu. So here we go. The demo of Five Nights at Freddy's was released on IndieDB on July 23rd, 2014. There were not many people playing it at all close to the demo's release, except for one person. There seems to be only one person who received not just the demo, but the full game almost two weeks before its official release, and that was Ben the Scoopist. Ben was the first ever person to post a gameplay video of Five Nights at Freddy's on YouTube. In the video, he mentions that he previously played The Desolate Hope on his channel and that Scott sent him FNAF early. I'm really excited to play this. He actually came out and gave it to me, which is so cool. It's actually on Steam Greenlight. I'll throw all the links up to his website, to the Steam Greenlight. Ben's video only sits at 50k views despite being the first ever playthrough of FNAF on YouTube, which blows my mind. The full game was eventually released to the public on August 8th, 2014 on a website called The Sura. The game blew up almost instantaneously because of one YouTuber who decided to make a Let's Play video about it, Yamimash. On August 10th, 2014, only two days after the game's release, Yamimash posted his playthrough of FNAF. He was one of the first YouTubers to play FNAF and it seemed like his audience loved the game. His video then caught the attention of a young Markiplier, whose channel was at roughly 2.7 million subscribers at the time. Markiplier's Let's Play was posted on August 12th and was an instant success, garnering over 7 million views in its first month. What is FNAF? Let's just start at the very beginning, baby! FNAF! F-N-A-F? I discovered FNAF, like probably most of you out there, via the King Markiplier. Markiplier was playing this brand new game, Five Nights at Freddy's, and it just turned into an internet sensation. It sweeped across the nation back in 2014, can you believe? I want to talk a bit about how FNAF even got introduced to me in the first place, because it's a fairly weird story how it came about, and it's all thanks to my good friend Bats. I remember it was a New Year's Eve. It was December the 31st, 2014, and we were just playing some poker, enjoying ourselves, you know, having some casual games, and he made mentioned this thing called Five Nights at Freddy's. It was abbreviated FNAF. I was like, wait, what? Apparently it had like animatronics in. It had this creepy gameplay mechanic, but there was this other layer to the game, which Baz emphasized, talking about how there's creepy mysteries within it. And like, if you research, you might find weird things. I remember being super interested immediately from that point, And I got hooked on the whole concept of the game. After Mark played FNAF, the game was in an odd situation. FNAF started blowing up before it was even released on Steam. August was also the month that ScottGames.com was updated with the new FNAF teaser for the very first time. Scott posted the official poster for the game, along with a hyperlink that encouraged fans to vote to get FNAF greenlit on Steam and to download the full game on Desura. Due to FNAF's sudden rise to fame, the game got greenlit pretty quickly, being added to Steam eight days after Markiplier played it. Pretty soon, every Let's Player on the planet was playing FNAF. Jacksepticeye, PewDiePie, Cory X Kenshin, Dan TDM, Moist Critical, Aya's Cupquake, and even a young Docos Games tried playing the new indie hit. Other than the fact that FNAF videos got a ton of views, people loved the new take on the indie horror genre. Another thing that started popping up was FNAF songs. A channel called The Living Tombstone released their FNAF song called Five Nights at Freddy's the same month as the game's release, which went on to accumulate over 272 million views. Other artists making FNAF songs started popping up over time, such as DA Games, CG5, JT Music, CK9C, and Try Hard Ninja. Five Nights at Freddy's! Hello! Hello, John! Hello FNAF, I'm here on the anniversary of Five Nights at Freddy's, it's been eight years, can you believe it? So John has invited me on his amazing channel to talk about my favourite memories in the whole of FNAF. It's been a wild ride. FNAF 1 altogether is a memory to me. I can't really think of anything specific with FNAF apart from just the whole game, the atmosphere of the game. When you think back at FNAF 1, just the atmosphere music and the carousel music as well. Foxy singing. Dum 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 dum. Uh, dum 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 dum.
One other thing that started popping up was FNAF fan games. The list of FNAF fan games that came out even in just 2014 and 2015 is way too long for me to read right now, but we will talk more about fan games later. One of the main hubs where FNAF fans go to speculate was created on August 14th, 2014, and that was the FNAF Reddit. The Reddit page is where the community would come together to post fan art, theories, and to interact with Scott Cawthon, who once in a while would reply to some of the community's posts. Meanwhile, in the mainstream media world, FNAF was getting pretty good reviews. The Highlander back in 2014 stated that, quote, players looking for thrills should visit Freddy Fazbear's Pizza because Five Nights at Freddy's is the most unique indie horror game on the market right now, and we need more games like it. The game's reviews and reactions definitely weren't all sunshine and rainbows, though. There were a fair amount of YouTubers and game reviewers who disliked the game, but for a small indie game made by one guy, it was doing pretty well. To me, the game's atmosphere really sells it. When you put on headphones and dive into the game, it actually feels like you're trapped in that office, being hunted by haunted animatronics. But obviously, one of the top things that made the game as popular as it was, was the jump scares. On September 11th, 2014, ScottGames.com was updated with a new FNAF teaser for the second time ever. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 The Grand Reopening was officially on the way. The game had a tentative release date of 2015, and people were hyped. With the confirmation of a sequel, FNAF was now not just a one-hit wonder, it was developing into a franchise. 16 days later, on September 27th, 2014, ScottGames.com was updated once again with a new teaser for the second installment. This one reading, Something Borrowed, Something New, with our first look at Withered Bonnie and Toy Bonnie. And then, only nine days later, on October 6, 2014, a new teaser for FNAF 2 dropped on Scott Games. It was our first look at Withered Foxy and Mangle. Now, in terms of FNAF 2, this one is when everything went crazy, okay? I remember Scott released the first teaser for it, and it was the toy animatronics. Seeing those guys for the first time, seeing these new shiny animatronics was so insane, and also getting to theorize about, you know, Chica 2.0, Foxy 2.0 before we knew what the toy animatronics were. People loved this teaser because Foxy seemed to be a fan favorite character at the time. The hype for FNAF 2 could not be more real, and fans were now more excited than ever due to the constant release of new teasers. Scott Cawthon was a master at building hype for his games, and this strategy is what helped give FNAF legs for years to come. Another nine days after the Foxy and Mangle teaser, we got our first look at one of the new mechanics for the game. We got the no place to run and exactly one place to hide teaser. This teaser hinted that we may have to climb into an animatronic to hide from the others. This ended up being the player putting on a Freddy mask to disguise themselves from the other animatronics facial recognition systems. This was actually confirmed shortly after this teaser came out when the official trailer for FNAF 2 released on Scott's YouTube channel on October 21st, 2014. The trailer was an instant hit. People loved the cinematic feel of the trailer with its epic music and animations. Shortly after the trailer's release, people started posting their reactions and analyses. This was the beginning of the FNAF YouTuber community. I remember the biggest thing people were talking about is how the game had no doors. The doors in FNAF 1 were a staple of the gameplay and made the players feel safe. Now that they were gone, people were terrified for the next installment. The trailer began with the bop of the 17th century, London Bridge. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. <laughs> The use of that song was perfect for a FNAF trailer because it kind of turns something that's supposed to be for kids into something that is horrifying, kind of like FNAF. One of the biggest rumors about the trailer was that if you played the London Bridge song in reverse, it would say, the killer is out, Mike kill all, this is enough. I remember seeing those videos and not only believing it, but being even more terrified for the new game. The trailer revealed that the animatronics could just jump out of the darkness at any time. The trailer also revealed that the phone guy was back. This left many people questioning how this could be, knowing that Phone Guy supposedly died in FNAF 1. Either Phone Guy survived FNAF 1, or this game was a prequel. The theories from the FNAF community started flooding in, and speaking of theories... It's worth mentioning that one of the other top videos that helped FNAF become as popular as it was was released shortly after the FNAF 2 trailer. On October 23rd, 2014, Matt Pat from The Game Theorist posted his first theory video on FNAF. While Markiplier's viral playthrough of FNAF got people hooked with the gameplay, Matt Pat's video combined with all of the new teasers we were getting really got people hooked with the story of the game. Markiplier and Matt Pat's videos were officially going viral, setting the stage for FNAF to become a huge franchise in the gaming space. With all of these teasers and the newly 
newly released trailer, people were so hyped to see what Scott had in store, searching for any clues about what the game would be about and when it would be released. This is when things started to get interesting. Scott actually did one of his only interviews ever on November 4th, 2014 with Click Team Fusion, the company that made the software that Scott used to make his FNAF games. I'll leave a link to the interview in the description below if you want to check it out. Scott reveals many cool things about his life before FNAF and some of his older games, but the main thing that got people's attention was the announcement that FNAF 2 would no longer be coming out in 2015, it would be coming out on Christmas Day 2014. This would not be the first time that a FNAF game got released earlier than expected. Only five days after that interview on November 9th, Scott Games was updated once again with its final FNAF 2 teaser. What many people may think is a black image with a box for Cam 11 at the bottom is actually our first look at the marionette. Several people in the community figured out that if you brighten the image, you can see a marionette standing in the prize counter area. But in terms of my favorite memory, it was whenever they first released the marionette teaser and me and Pro Class Gamer immediately DM'd each other on Skype and we were like, dude, we gotta cover this. We did like a dual commentary covering the teaser and just talking about like, what is this thing? It's popping out of a box. It's like in the shadows and just the amount of like obscurity that was in the game and that like just not knowing what was really going on at that point was just the best. People had a ton of theories about this image, but without more context, it was hard to figure out anything concrete about how this character would fit into the lore in the gameplay. We would soon get that context when the official extended FNAF 2 demo was sent to select YouTubers by Scott Cawthon only a day later, over a month before the game's projected release date. Markiplier, CoreyX Kenshin, and a few other YouTubers received the demo directly from Scott himself via email on November 10th. They were the only people on the planet who were able to play one of the most anticipated games of 2014, so naturally their Let's Plays blew up. Markiplier already had his first three videos up on the game in the span of 24 hours, with the first one already accumulating over 3 million views. FNAF was officially back and blowing up all over again thanks to some of the biggest YouTubers on the planet. People loved FNAF 2. With the new mechanics, new pizzeria, new jump scares, people were enamored with the experience it brought. But one part of the game that was brand new that kept everyone curious about what was going on at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza was the cutscenes. One of the major reasons the original FNAF took off was because of its lore. Using the posters on the walls, people started to get a sense that there was a story behind these haunted animatronics. And with the help of MatPat and Reddit, people really started to try and find every clue possible to get us closer to a concrete story. Scott decided to lean into the storytelling aspect a lot more with FNAF 2, introducing various 8-bit minigames and 3D cutscenes throughout the game. After completing each night, you would get a 3D cutscene of you on stage as Freddy Fazbear looking around at the other animatronics. 8-bit minigames would show up randomly after getting jump scared. These were arguably the creepiest part of FNAF 2. There are four 8-bit minigames in FNAF 2, beginning with a more innocent one of us playing as Foxy walking off stage to surprise some kids while a creepy pink man? Purple man? Violet? While the creepy man watches from the distance to us walking through the original FNAF pizzeria with blood everywhere while we follow a floating marionette. Yeah, these minigames were vague enough for them to be confusing, but clear enough for people to understand loosely what the story was supposed to be. Lucky for you, I am not going to break down the entire lore of FNAF in this video because we would be here all day. Maybe I'll make that video one day. No. Anyways, these cutscenes and minigames were exactly what the franchise needed to help keep the hype going. Around this time, FNAF hoaxes were also pretty popular. This was essentially fans making fake images that looked like they're real easter eggs from the games. The most popular hoaxes back then were Sparky the Dog and FNAF 1 and the Purple Man animatronic from FNAF 2, but you know, there's a lot more than that now. On November 13th, 2014, only one day after FNAF 2's official release, Scott Games officially went dark, not showing any other games or hyperlinks, just one black image with the word offline. The FNAF community was in shambles. People were wetting the bed. People were losing sleep, selling all of their Bitcoin because what if this was the end? What if FNAF was over? What if we were never going to get another... When you brighten the image, you can see text in the bottom that states, until next time. This image stayed on Scott Games for a while. At least it was a while compared to the near weekly updates we were getting. The website wasn't updated until about a month later. So let's try a few edits, see if we can get anything. And instantly, guys, on the right now, it's changed to a number three and nobody's realized it could have been here for days, guys. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was officially on the way. For the next month, scottgames.com went dark. No new teasers, trailers, or anything, yet, 
FNAF kept growing. During this time, MatPat released his game theory on FNAF 2, and Let's Players kept posting their reactions to the newest games. The FNAF Reddit was filled with theories and tons of fan art, and people were anxiously awaiting the third installment. After a month of silence, Scott Games was finally updated on January 2nd, 2015. The teaser featured a brand new animatronic with the text, I am still here. This was a quite shocking teaser, considering no one knew who the animatronic was. In the image, you can only see half of its face, so naturally people tried mirroring it to see if they could identify the mystery animatronic. When mirrored, it sort of resembled Golden Freddy, but with completely new features. 12 days later, we got an even better look at the new animatronic when the What Can We Use teaser dropped on January 14th. The teaser featured all of the toy animatronics from FNAF 2 stuffed into a cardboard box, and when brightened, the mystery animatronic standing ominously next to it. People still seem to think that this was Golden Freddy, and honestly, I did too. The animatronic did look somewhat like a bear and was golden, and we didn't get a good look at the ears yet, so you couldn't really blame anyone. People had a lot of theories about what this teaser could mean, most of them thinking that we were going to learn a lot more about Golden Freddy and that the toy animatronics were going to be back. Little did they know, less than two weeks later, their theories would be thrown in the trash. On January 26th, the trailer for Five Nights at Freddy's 3 hit YouTube. FNAF was at peak popularity at the time, and you could make a good argument that to this day, the FNAF 3 era was the most popular FNAF has ever been. Millions of people tuned in to see what the next FNAF game had in store. The FNAF YouTube community was also starting to form at this time, posting their reactions and analyses of the new trailer. The trailer consisted of mostly cinematic shots with text reading, he will come back, he always does, we have a place for him, and ending with a jump scare. The FNAF community on YouTube and Reddit were officially off to the races, looking for hidden secrets and clues to what this game could be about. Even after the trailer came out and we got a good look at the new animatronic, people still did not know what the heck this thing was. Some people still thought it was Golden Freddy, some thought it was Golden Bonnie, and others thought it may be a hybrid of the two. ScottGames.com was updated the same day the trailer came out with the words he always does in purple text. This led people to believe that the text in the trailer wasn't talking about the phone guy, the night guard, or the mystery animatronic, but the purple guy. Little did they know that some of those things might be related in more ways than one. On February 3rd, ScottGames.com was updated once again with our first look at the map for FNAF 3. When brightened up, you could see that there was a ventilation system connecting the whole pizzeria that presumably animatronics could crawl through. This map debunked the theory that some people had that FNAF 3 would take place in the FNAF 1 pizzeria since the map is completely different. People continued theorizing all over the internet, asking questions about what this game was going to be about, why does the purple guy keep coming back, and most of all, who is that new Golden Freddy slash Bonnie hybrid? Well, we didn't find out the name of this mystery animatronic until February 15th when Scott made a post on Steam titled Early Beta Testing Successful. In this post, updating the community on the progress of FNAF 3, there are multiple words with double letters in them. When you eventually put all the double letters together, it's spelled out, my name is Springtrap. Scott was very active on Steam, interacting with fans and answering questions fairly regularly, so it wasn't really a shock that he made this big reveal on Steam. In fact, the same day, Scott put a new post on the forum saying, it's true, I was hacked, and the game is cancelled. Someone released it for free here, with a link to this Game Jolt page. The community was confused, and collectively freaked out, and immediately downloaded the game. And when they opened the game, this is what happened. What's up, YouTube? What's going on, Corey? Continuing, welcome to Five Nights at Freddy's 3. It's finally out, you guys. Let's do it. This was the first troll of many for Scott Cawthon. The troll game was basically a reskin of one of Scott's older games, There Is No Pause Button. Even though it was obviously a troll by Scott, people actually thought that Scott was hacked, leading him to update his post to reassure everyone that he isn't hacked, FNAF 3 is still coming, and to enjoy the game he made for everyone. One month after the He Always Does teaser on ScottGames.com, the website was updated again, this time with one on March 1st and then one on March 2nd. These teasers featured Balloon Boy, Chica, and Foxy with a wooden-like texture on them. Them. People didn't really know what to make of these, theorizing that these were older versions of the animatronics maybe made out of wood. But the thing that caught people's attention the most was when you brightened up the Balloon Boy image, you could see a giant number 10, which seemed like the beginning of a countdown. People legit freaked out at this, including Daco. What is going on guys? Daco back again, and finally, Scott has posted a new teaser on his website, and it says, guess who, with Balloon Boy, guys, Balloon Boy, holy crap guys, it's freaking Balloon Boy, but it's what if you brighten it up guys there's a 10 there's a freaking 10 there which means five nights at freddy's free the demo or the full game i don't know is going to be released the 10th but sadly it doesn't say 
the 10th of March, the 10th of April, who knows, but it just says a 10. Was this a countdown? Was it going to be released 10 days from now, 10 weeks from now, 10 months from now? And actually none of those were correct. The FNAF 3 demo was sent to select YouTubers on March 2nd, 2015, the day after the countdown started on scottgames.com. FNAF 3 playthroughs quickly started being posted on YouTube with Markiplier's video getting over 1 million views in its first seven hours. The game was then officially released to the public the very next day on March 3rd, 2015. The game featured only one physical animatronic who could kill you and that was Springtrap. The goal of the game was to distract Springtrap using sound cues through the camera system to keep him away from you until 6 a.m. All the while resetting your audio camera and ventilation system so you don't get jump scared by various hallucinations of past animatronics. At the beginning we were introduced to the phone dude voiced by Scott Cawthon himself who then turned into the regular phone guy after some old training tapes were found and played for us in the place of phone dude. In the game there was a small chance you would get a secret screen of an up close shot of a spring trap where you could see the remains of a human body inside of him. These secret images were also in FNAF 2 with Withered Foxy, Withered Freddy, and Toy Bonnie. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 came with mixed reviews and continues to be one of the most divisive games in the franchise. The game gave us a ton of lore with Phone Dude and Phone Guy's calls each night, secret mini games, and newspaper clippings, but some didn't like that it wasn't scary enough. People said that the spring trap jump scares weren't very effective and that the stakes were lowered because of that. Also, casual players were starting to get lost and confused by the lore since you had to actively seek it out by finding cupcakes, clicking on a shadow Bonnie figure, and typing a code into the walls of the office. The whole community came together to try and piece the vague 8-bit minigames into one cohesive story slash timeline. And I would say that the community did a pretty good job with the little information that they were given. No matter what some reviewers had to say, FNAF 3 was another success for Scott Cawthon, with the trailer getting the most views out of all the other FNAF games and the community being more alive than ever. It was during this time, on April 7th, 2015, the news broke that Warner Brothers picked up the rights for a FNAF movie. We were actually getting a Five Nights at Freddy's movie. With the release of FNAF 3, ScottGames.com was updated one last time, with no secrets, no easter eggs, just Freddy's hat in the spotlight. A final goodbye to the majorly successful trilogy that changed the- Oh. The hat is gone. On April 22nd, 2015, only 50 days after the release of FNAF 3 and ScottGames.com being updated, the hat vanished. And the community was in shambles. People were asking, where did it go? Who took it? Is there actually gonna be a fourth FNAF game? Well, Yes. Five days later, the hat returned in a big way, being held by none other than Nightmare Freddy in our first ever teaser for Five Nights at Freddy's 4. The community ran with the name Nightmare Freddy because when you brighten the teaser, it shows the word Nightmare at the bottom. The game would be called FNAF 4, the final chapter, and had a release date of Halloween 2015. The game seemed to be leaning way more into the horror elements that people were looking for in FNAF 3. It looked like Scott was actually listening to criticism in regards to FNAF 3 not being scary enough and decided to course correct a bit. My guess is that Scott valued the poor reviews of his game because the poor reviews of his games were the reason FNAF began in the first place. A week and a half after the Nightmare Freddy teaser, we got our first look at Nightmare Bonnie, this time with the words, was it me, in the top left corner. The community immediately connected this question with the Bite of 87. The Bite of 87 was one of the biggest mysteries of the first FNAF game, and now three games into the franchise, we still didn't know which animatronic actually did the biting. People started noticing a pattern, predicting that each new teaser would feature a new version of the classic animatronics in Nightmare form and that's exactly what happened. We got Nightmare Chica on May 16th and Nightmare Foxy on May 29th. Chica's teaser still had the nightmare text when brightened while Foxy's said out of order, both asking the same question of was it me or me? The thing that was the most out of the ordinary about these teasers was that Foxy had a tongue. This was the first time Foxy was seen with a tongue and the last since it was cut from the final game. The teaser that followed these broke the pattern that was established over the past few weeks and shocked everyone. On June 11th, 2015, this image was uploaded to scottgames.com. It featured a purple hat and bow tie under a spotlight. When brightened, you could see the text property of fur, er, fur, er, I don't know. When I first saw this teaser, I naturally thought it meant Freddy Fazbear because it started with an FR and ended with an R. But upon further inspection, you can actually tell that it ends in an ER and not an R, which is not how you spell Fazbear. The community quickly pieced together that the text probably reads property of Fredbear's family diner. This was significant because that was supposedly the first pizzeria and the place where the first murder took place. The community started to theorize that maybe FNAF 4 would show us more about what happened at Fredbear's family diner and why the purple guy decided to start his killing spree. The teasers on FNAF 4 are probably the best, I'd say, 
best teasers would go to FNAF 4. The memory that I think of with FNAF 4 specifically is Fred Bear. The next teaser followed the same idea as the first FNAF 4 teaser, someone placing a hat in the spotlight and then someone picking it up. And in this case, two weeks later on June 25th, we saw Nightmare Fred Bear sporting the purple bow tie with a giant mouth mouth stomach these teasers were getting so crazy that if you looked into the source code of the website and went to a random chunk of scrambled letters moved each letter back one letter in the alphabet it actually spelled out fredbear checking the source code was a vital part of figuring out the lore at this point in the series and that's why the fnaf community to this day takes every little clue seriously because even a random bunch of letters in the source code of a website could have big lore secrets hidden within the next fnaf teaser arrived on july 9th and featured what seemed to be a mini version of springtrap sitting in a chair with the words terrible things come in small packages above it. When brightened, you could clearly see four doorways, two on each side of the hallway. The community figured out that this character's name was Plush Trap, once again, through the source code. This time, Scott used an encryption technique called Caesar's Cipher, a type of substitution cipher in which each letter in the plain text is replaced by a letter some fixed number of positions down the alphabet. Back then, if you weren't at least a little familiar with cryptography, you were not going to figure out the new FNAF lore, or you were just waiting for someone else to figure it out for you. But with the thousands of people in the FNAF Reddit, it usually took about an hour, sometimes less. On July 13th, 2015, only four days after the Plush Trap teaser, the FNAF 4 trailer hit YouTube. At this point, everyone was in full theory mode, looking into every detail and looking for every clue they can to see how this game fits into the lore we already kind of know. The trailer starts off with a shot of a flashlight flickering on on and off down a hallway. This was the first time we got it confirmed that this game was going to be set inside of a house. I remember watching this trailer and losing my mind at how good the graphics looked and how cool and different it felt. I think one of the big reasons FNAF is so successful is because Scott changed things up quite a bit, but not enough for it not to feel like a FNAF game. The trailer showed Foxy, Chica, Plush Trap, The Freddles, and lastly a jump scare from Bonnie. That jump scare was different from any of the past games. The model was creepier, the animation was improved, and it just hit different. It's safe to say the community went nuts over this trailer, trying to figure out a few things. How a camera system would fit into the game, how did we get to the part of the house Plush Trap was in, and why were these giant nightmare animatronics roaming through someone's house late at night like they got up to get a glass of warm milk because they couldn't sleep or something? We'd soon find out. Some of these answers. <laughs> On July 21st, 2015, Docco and Rasbowski uploaded videos titled Official FNAF 4 Demo Reaction. Scott Cawthon actually sent Docco and Raz FNAF 4 two days before everyone else in order to tell everyone what they thought of the game. Both of their videos started with their reaction to the Bonnie jump scare, and it's just a joy to watch. Oh, things are starting to move now. Oh, things are starting to move now. Oh, my. Oh! Oh! What the hell? The game is absolutely terrifying and I still don't like playing it now because it's so scary because you have to rely on sound and usually I get really scared when I think I'm going to be okay. I don't hear breathing and I put on the flashlight and I'm dead. Uh, still scary. The jump scares are terrifying. Suddenly one day Scott emails myself and Darko and he's like, boys, you two. You gotta play test FNAF 4 for me. And we absolutely crapped ourselves. Because it wasn't supposed to be out till like Halloween that year, 2015. So I, I rushed home, I played it. Docker was on a boat somewhere in the middle of the ocean. It was released while I was in the middle of the ocean. On July 23rd, a select group of YouTubers were sent the FNAF 4 demo and given permission to post their gameplay. Then, on the same day, Scott decided to release the full game to the public. Very quickly, people started posting their playthroughs of FNAF 4, trying to get on the FNAF hype train. This was the day we got this amazing gem of a clip from Markiplier. The first night is never usually that bad in any of the games, so I'll play through. The game gave us more story than we've ever had before, showing us the journey of a kid who is being psychologically abused by his family, guided by a sentient Fredbear plushie, traumatized by something he saw at Fredbear's family diner, and counting down to his birthday party where his evil brother and his friends will pick him up and place him into Fredbear's mouth to eventually get his head bitten off. Was that the bite of 87? Nope. It was the bite of 83, because obviously on night 3 when you go back into the living room of the house and stand right in front of the TV for exactly 5 seconds, a commercial will start playing from Fred Bear and Friends with the year of 1983. Like I said, this game was filled with the most lore we've ever gotten in a FNAF game. Did it make the lore of the previous games less confusing? No. Do I think that FNAF 4 told a great story and perfectly laid out the dream theory that I think was the real canon that Scott intended for the series? Yes, but I won't get into that right now. The game ended with an emotional scene of the crying child on his deathbed, with presumably his brother telling him that he's sorry. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear. I'm sorry. You're broken. Is that about the bite? I will put you back together.
This person said to the crying child, you're broken. I will put you back together. Those were the final words before you can faintly hear the heart monitor flatline. And where do you hear those words again? That's right, Glamrock Freddy specifically said to... Oh, wrong video. And finally with FNAF 4, the box, okay? The box at the end of FNAF 4 is probably the most iconic, controversial memory that I can think of, the box. That's all I'm gonna say, if you know, you know. Upon beating nightmare mode, you're met with this box. After a few seconds, some words show up above the box. Some things are best left forgotten for now. The box had two locks that you could actually click on, but it did nothing. People tried everything to get the box open with no success. This would become one of the biggest questions in all of FNAF history. What's in the box? FNAF 4 was a really special game that told a solid story from beginning to end, but it also added a lot of questions to the lore that frustrated a lot of fans who wanted more answers. Overall, the game got a positive reception and was added to the ever-growing Five Nights at Freddy's franchise. Three days after the release of the game, ScottGames.com was updated with the final, the end, thanks for playing. But if you brighten the image, you could see a small, faint question mark after the end. At the time, it looked like Scott was coming back for round five. Exactly a week later, on August 2nd, 2015, Scott Games was updated with a final thank you poster featuring all of the animatronics in the series. FNAF, or at least the story of FNAF, seemed to be over. Almost exactly a month after the game's release, Scott Cawthon made a huge post on Steam, officially announcing a Halloween content update for FNAF 4, a secret project he's working on that wasn't FNAF 5, and some clarification about what we will never find out, what's in the box. Scott said, quote, now I want to talk about what won't be included, the box. You know, when I released the first game over a year ago, I was amazed at how quickly everyone found every bit of lore and story. Then the same happened with part two. Fans and YouTubers dug in and found everything. Game Theory did an incredible video on part two, getting almost everything right. Then part three came out, and once again, the story was uncovered by the community. It seemed that there was nothing I could hide, but then I released part four, and somehow, no one, not a single person, found the pieces. The story remains completely hidden. I guess most people assumed that I filled the game with random easter eggs this time. I didn't. What's in the box? It's the pieces put together. But the bigger question is, would the community accept it that way? The fact that the pieces have remained elusive this time strikes me as incredible and special, a fitting conclusion in some ways, and because of that, I've decided that maybe some things are best left forgotten forever. This blew everyone's minds and made everyone more determined than ever to figure out FNAF 4. More on that later. On September 9th, 2015, ScottGames.com was updated once again. The endoskeleton on the right side of the image looked completely different. It almost looked cartoonish. These updates continued almost daily, slowly turning every animatronic in the image into a cute cartoonish version of itself. This was extremely confusing considering the community had no idea what Scott had planned. A few days into these updates, on September 15th, Scott took to Steam to officially announce FNAF World, an RPG game where you could choose from a bunch of beloved FNAF characters to fight against enemies. He assured people that this was not a horror game, but a fun type of game that he's been wanting to make for a while now. He also made it very clear that there would not be a FNAF 5, saying, It's very important for me to say again that there will not be a Five Nights at Freddy's 5. The story is complete, and the Halloween update and new game will not add to it. In the post, he stated that he called the new FNAF World animatronics the adventure characters, and that it would be unlikely that a demo for FNAF World would be ready by Halloween since the game was still in early development. Even though Scott said there wasn't going to be a FNAF 5, people were still hyped. We still had FNAF World and the FNAF 4 Halloween update to look forward to. Little did they know that one of the most important days in the history of FNAF was soon to be upon them. It was a warm September night. The forecast was cloudy with a 30% chance I I'm sorry. September 18th, 2015, a day that would soon be written into every history book known to man. This was the day Matt Pat planned his big FNAF Theory livestream with Daco, Razbowski, Ryan, and other Ryan from 8-Bit Gaming, and Smike. The stream was meant to be a big collaboration with all of the biggest FNAF YouTubers in order to try and figure out the lore. The stream was a major success, but there was one huge problem. The stream kept crashing. The stream crashed literally two or three times before they finally got a stable connection. But while the stream was crashing, one person was watching it all go down. Scott Cawthon. Daco just tweeted out two minutes ago that Scott commented on Steam 11 minutes ago. Yeah. They were getting too close to the truth. Oh, we were getting too close to the truth, according to Scott. Scott. We're, we're, we're still fighting, man. We're fighting back today. Scott saw an opportunity at this point, and he took it. With the internet issues MatPat was having, they weren't able to have the original panel on screen, and while they were gone, ScottGames.com updated for a brief moment. In the FNAF 4 minigame. Okay. 
Okay, which, okay. We're talking it's about the FNAF- like Atari graphics toy, like, next to the headless Foxy, there's a beakless Chica. Is, is there a beakless Chica in- Is that in... what you say? Shortly after this, Docco arrived saying that Scott actually emailed him the exact same message put on Scott Games. A few minutes later, Scott emailed Docco with another question. Scott stood another question. Whoa. Oh god, he said, What he's seeing in shadows is easily misunderstood in the mind of a child. Sorry. <laughs> it was after this question that they started putting the pieces together. Maybe FNAF 2 never actually happened. Maybe all of these games were just nightmares of a crying child. The final hint Scott gave them was four words. Four games, one story. We kind of assumed it was, but it was good to know that there's not multiple stories going on at the same time in this franchise. That would be... This live stream was a huge moment for the community and honestly for figuring out the lore of these four games. Those clues led to MatPat's video he released that December where I believe he was correct in his theory about some of, if not all of these games being just a dream. But as Scott said, would the community accept it that way? Scott updated his announcement post for FNAF World on September 21st, 2015, stating that all of the FNAF World characters have been added to scottgames.com. Not only that, but we got a rough release date coming 2016, seriously. Obviously poking fun at the fact that Scott hasn't really been the best with release dates. A few days after the FNAF World teasers were finished, Scott created fnafworld.com, a dedicated website for FNAF World teasers. Once once that website was created, scottgames.com became dedicated to teasing FNAF 4 Halloween Edition. There were five total teasers for the game, Jack O'Bonnie, Nightmare Balloon Boy, Nightmare Own, and Jack O'Chica. One interesting thing to point out about the Nightmare Own teaser is that when you saved the image, it was titled Don't Wake the Baby. This was Scott referencing Markiplier's FNAF 2 playthrough where he repeated that phrase while trying to avoid the puppet jump scare. On October 28th, 2015, FNAFworld.com was updated and let's just say the community was confused. If you logged onto FNAFworld.com, you would be met with text saying, and I quote, I hex hackered scoot sites and well released to full version on FNAFworld tonight at exactly 6 p.m. CST. Don't tread to stop me, lulz hacks. Then it was updated again not too long after, and I quote, I mean it. I'm going to release it tonight at 6 p.m. CST. Take me seriously, you'll be sorry. I will post to link right here, lulz hacks. I think most of the community was aware that this was Scott trolling since this seemed to be a pattern with Scott based on the FNAF 3 troll game, but there was a good amount of people online expressing concern that FNAFworld.com might have actually been hacked. One final message appeared on FNAFworld.com right when lulz hacks said it would. The message read, I has released that it lulz hacks, download fan for world with a hyperlink to download the game. And once you downloaded the game, this is what you saw. Yo! Whoa, this music! The game was once again a reskin of one of Scott's older games, Fighter Mage Bard. The community actually didn't mind this troll game and seemed to have a lot of fun with it. On October 30th, 2015, FNAF 4 Halloween Edition was released, one day before its scheduled release. Scott even took to Steam to joke about how we should be proud of him for releasing it this close to the actual release date. Although people were hoping for some answers about the lore and maybe an opening of the box, none of that happened. But it was still a very fun update to an already great game. The new designs were awesome and it was so cool to see Nightmare Yone, Nightmare BB, and Nightmare Mangle added to the mix. On the same day as the release of FNAF 4 Halloween Edition, Scott posted the teaser trailer for FNAF World on his YouTube channel. The beginning of the trailer was not like anything we were expecting. It looked like a regular FNAF trailer until about 34 seconds in. The trailer featured all of the characters we saw in Scott Games grouped into teams of four battling obscure enemies we've never seen before. After listing all of the characters we'd see in the game, we saw possibly the cutest thing ever, Adventure Mangle playing with a paddle ball. It ended with a release date of coming soon. The trailer had a mixed reaction from fans. Some criticized the animation style and graphics, while others were curious why this game was being made in the first place. But overall, I would say a majority of the community loved the trailer and was looking forward to the new game. The game was looking to be a light-hearted entry to the series, but the light-heartedness did not last for long. On November 2nd, 2015, we got possibly the creepiest FNAF teaser to this day. When you went on scottgames.com, it looked like there was nothing there. But when you brightened the dark image, what you saw was what appeared to be Mangle hanging himself with the word 
words, look what you've all done. The community was shocked by this teaser to say the least. A lot of people were concerned about Scott's well-being after this teaser. Within an hour, the teaser was gone off of FNAFworld.com and we still to this day have no idea how it connects to FNAF World. Scott Games then remained dark for nearly a month. Scott finally came back on November 29th with a new teaser. This teaser featured a weird version of Balloon Boy's head with the words madness takes many forms at the bottom. It seemed like Scott wanted to show us that there was going to be a dark side to FNAF World but initially maybe went too far. This teaser seemed to keep the same promise with a little course correction on exactly how dark he wanted to go. On December 11th, 2015, ScottGames.com updated with a teaser for the first ever FNAF book. Initially, it was titled Five Nights of Freddy's The Untold Story but was later changed to The Silver Eyes and was given a release date of December 22nd, 2015. Of course, in true Scott Cawthon fashion, it was released five days early on December 17th, 2015. Shortly after the book was released, some people in the community were upset that the book did not directly align with the games. People thought that maybe this book would help solve some of the lore from the games, but Scott had different intentions. Three days later, Scott announced that the FNAF books overall weren't directly canon to the official FNAF games. Basically, the book was a part of the FNAF multiverse. The same characters, same locations, but different turn of events. For the next month, we didn't really get much. On December 4th, we got a Merry Christmas FNAF World teaser, and then on New Year's Day 2016, we got an update from Scott on the progress of FNAF World, saying that he's still working hard and quote, it's becoming a bigger game than I'd first planned it to be, but that's a good thing. On January 8th, 2016, we got a second trailer for FNAF World that was only posted on IndieDB. The trailer was basically a copy of the first one, but it just added new gameplay shots. On January 12th, 2016, Scott took to Steam to give us an official release date for FNAF World. The game would be hitting Steam on February 19th, followed by the mobile ports in the following weeks. He also announced that he and his wife had just had a baby boy. Quote, in other news, I had a new addition to my family today, a baby boy. I'm typing this from the hospital now, as a matter of fact, so obviously that has still kept me a little busy as well. Scott later updated the release date to the weekend of January 23rd to 24th, stating, I won't make it to February 19th. Clear your schedules for this weekend, winky face. Then he said on January 21st, the game will release tomorrow, guys, relax. Then again, I've never been good with release dates. And he did exactly not that. He released the game that day on January 21st. The game quickly started getting mixed reviews with a lot of people finding bugs and noticing missing features that they thought would be there. People also didn't like that the overworld was in 2D and not 3D like the trailers insinuated. The game held an ironic 87% on Steam, which was overall very good, but there were a lot of negative reviews. Scott reacted very quickly to the mixed reactions, creating a post on Steam titled To The Community. In the post, he talks about how people have accused him of releasing his games too early in the past, mentioning that he never felt he did that until now. He apologized for the state of FNAF World and promised to keep updating the game to turn it into what he envisioned. Three days later, Scott announced that he was taking FNAF World off of Steam despite its 87% rating. He said that he's working on a new version of the game with a fully 3D world and all of the features he promised in the past. This time, the game would be released for free on Game Jolt. This new version of the game would soon be released on February 8th, 2016 to Game Jolt, just as promised. The game had a fully 3D world and even featured some new content, including a man sitting at a desk telling us to go away. On February 18th, 2016, FNAFworld.com and ScottGames.com updated with new teasers. The FNAFworld.com teaser announced the FNAF World Update 2, while ScottGames.com had lines. No words, nothing when you brighten the image, just 17 lines all in a row. Most of the community thought it was some sort of timeline. Some thought it was related to the FNAF movie, and some thought, maybe, just maybe we'd be getting FNAF 5. Eight days later, on February 26, one of the lines changed into the letter I, with an N seen above the lines to the left when the image was brightened. Still, no one had any idea what this meant. Obviously, it was trying to spell something out, but what? Two weeks later, the lines were updated again, another I with an A in the top right when brightened. Once again, it was spelling out something, but nobody could figure it out with so little letters. 11 days later, an O was added. Two weeks after that, another O was added, along with the word never at the bottom when brightened. The community was collectively confused, until April 23rd, 2016, when the first official teaser for FNAF's sister location was posted. The teaser featured a brand new animatronic, with the words, there was never just one at the bottom. No one had any idea who this new animatronic was. All they knew was that it looked like a clown animatronic. This game looked like it was going to be a clean slate for FNAF, with new characters and a new location, and the community couldn't be more excited. On May 3rd, 2016, the release date for FNAF World Update 2 was announced 
announced on FNAFWorld.com. The update was set to release on May 13th, 2016, and fans were hyped since that was only 10 days away. To everyone's surprise, the update actually came out on its set release date. The new update featured 8 new party members, 9 minigames, 2 new areas, a new ending, new abilities, and 3 enemies. The community loved this new update. The new minigames were fun, annoying, and creepy all at the same time. This was when we first met Chica's Magic Rainbow, Foxy.exe, and this. You won't get tired. Oh no, I love your voice. Oh, 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 no, no, that's not my editing, guys. I swear. <laughs> it sounds like something I would do. <laughs> but one of the biggest parts of the update came from the man sitting at the desk that I mentioned earlier. After beating the main boss, we got to hear the voice of a new animatronic named Baby, which was presumed to be the animatronic currently on scottgames.com. The show will begin momentarily. On May 11th, some of the mysteries about sister location were no longer mysteries. Magicraft Cat on Reddit found what seemed to be the names of all of the new characters that were going to be in sister location. The names were found under Scott's name on copy copyright.gov. When you copyright something, most of the time it becomes public information. So when Scott went to copyright his new characters, it wouldn't be long until fans found them. And they did. The community was disappointed and worried about the characters being leaked, but there was one person who wasn't. Scott Cawthon. Scott replied to the Reddit post with the leaks saying, no worries guys, the characters needed to be copyrighted and I knew this would get out. Have fun speculating. On May 15th, someone asked Scott on Steam if there would be voice acting in Sister Location. He replied with, yes, there will be voice acting in Sister Location. Five days later, on May 16, 2016, we got a new Sister Location teaser and our first good look at the newest animatronic, Baby. The teaser had text at the bottom that read, Everyone please stay in your seats. I remember one of the big things about this teaser is that people thought they could see the reflection of Springtrap in Baby's nose, and I kind of still believe that to be the case. The FNAF hype was officially back. We were getting FNAF 5 with new characters, a new location, and according to Scott on Steam, the game would also feature full voice acting. FNAF was not going anywhere anytime soon. Soon. On May 21st, 2016, the Sister Location trailer hit YouTube and it was unlike anything we were ever expecting. The trailer had an extremely futuristic vibe to it and the animatronics' faces moved. The trailer showed us some glimpses of gameplay while you could hear Don't Hold It Against Us in the background. Towards the end of the trailer, we got the amazing shot of all four of the new animatronics performing together, and then it ended with a baby jump scare that we never actually got to see in the final game. The trailer blew everyone away, but also left people with a lot of questions. How does this fit into the lore? When does this game take place? Where does this game take place? Is it going to be free roam? What's the last four digits of your social security number? One month after the trailer on June 17th, 2016, we got a new teaser on scottgames.com. This time, it featured a torn apart animatronic with a clown-like mask. This is an animatronic we have never seen before, and now that the names of the new characters were leaked, it was a guessing game for what its name was. It was either called Ennard, Biddybab, or Mini Rena, since those were the ones we haven't seen yet. Most people were speculating that this was Ennard based on the similarities of the words Ennard and Ennard. There was text at the bottom of the teaser that said there's a little of me in every body with the space between every and body. In the source code sometime around this image's release, we found what seemed to be a schedule for all of the animatronics, insinuating that these animatronics didn't belong to one single pizzeria, but were being rented out by people through this facility. We also found a short list of people and companies renting out these animatronics, one of them being named Chica's Party World. Chica's Party World is a place we have yet to see in the franchise and remains a mystery to this day. We also saw text that seemed to read Afton Robotics, which which is a direct reference to the first FNAF book where the stand-in for Purple Guy was named William Afton. Was Scott really about to take a page out of his own book? On June 23rd, 2016, Scott announced that he had just signed a three-book deal with Scholastic, one of the biggest publishers on the planet. Spoiler alert, Scholastic would go on to publish over 20 FNAF books and counting. I guess the first three ended up doing pretty well. <laughs> over two weeks later, on July 9th, 2016, we got another teaser on scottgames.com. The Minions, I, I mean the Biddy Babs. <laughs> one of the common themes with the Sister Location teaser was that no one knew what the heck was going on. With all of the other teasers for past games, you were able to theorize more about the game, but these were so new that it was hard to find something to say about them. But these teasers were an amazing showcase of all the new characters we'd be seeing in the game, and Scott really did do a good job with them. Less than two weeks later, on July 21st, we got this teaser with the text, Get Back on Your Stage, Now. The teaser had a panel at the center with two buttons, one to turn on the lights, and the other to shock the animatronics into getting them back on stage, although the community didn't know that at the time. Some people speculated that the red button was going to regenerate or power up the animatronics, but we all know how that turned out. Let's encourage Baby to cheer up with a controlled shock. 
When the image was brightened, you could see tiny dancing ballerinas on stage, which the community correctly identified as the mini arenas. August 1st, 2016 was the day that the Steam page for Sister Location went live with brand new gameplay screenshots and a description of the game. Welcome to Circus Baby's Pizza World, where family fun and interactivity go beyond anything you've seen at those other pizza places. With cutting edge animatronic entertainers that will knock your kids' socks off, as well as customized pizza catering, no party is complete without Circus Baby and the gang. Now hiring late night technician must enjoy cramped spaces and be comfortable around active machinery, not responsible for death or dismemberment. Obviously, we were not going to be the people enjoying our birthday parties with Circus Baby. We were going to be the late night technician, probably getting way underpaid for all the horrors that he was about to witness. The day is August 8th, 2016, and it's the two year anniversary of FNAF. Scott celebrated the anniversary by releasing seven new images to scottgames.com. This time, it was behind the scenes images from FNAF 1 and FNAF 3. These images were such a treat for the community since Scott has never really shared something like this ever before. But a week later, another big sister location leak appeared on Reddit. On August 15th, people found what seemed to be a full list of voice actors and some actual audio clips from the game. These were some pretty big leaks, but Scott took the last leaks really well, so surely he'd be taking these ones pretty- Cancelled due to leaks. On August 16th, the community collectively panicked until they brightened the image. If you brighten the image, you could see a ton of text talking about how there was a Circus Baby's Pizza World restaurant for a short period of time, but it was shut down due to gas leaks. This confirmed that the Funtime animatronics actually came from a restaurant and were being repurposed for the rental company. This also confirmed that something fishy happened at Circus Baby's Pizza World since it closed way too soon and for a reason like gas leaks that doesn't really warrant permanent closure. Scott collectively freaked everyone out for about five whole minutes since he was obviously messing around with the fact that there were leaks for his game a day prior. 11 days later on August 27th, 2016, we got the official release date for Sister Location on scottgames.com. The new teaser featured Enter's Mask with, when brightened up, the release date of October 7th, 2016. This teaser was replaced very shortly after with this one, showing the release date more clearly. But another big reveal lied within the source code of scottgames.com. In the source code, there were two strings of characters. If you put them together and then pasted them into the URL of Scott Games, you would be directed to the map for sister location. And then, if you brighten this secret image, you could see two secret rooms above and below the Funtime Auditorium. Scott really made us dig for this one. After these new teasers, scottgames.com wasn't updated for about a month. On September 24th, 2016, Ennard went missing. This is still one of the strangest teasers we've gotten on scottgames.com. My guess is that Scott wanted to remind people that the game was still coming out, but didn't have time to create a new teaser, but the real reason remains a mystery. This next moment is one of my all-time favorite favorite moments in the whole entire FNAF history, so please buckle up. It was October 4th, 2016, three days before Sister Location's set release. An unexpected post from Scott Cawthon hit Steam. Hey guys, I wanted to let everyone know what I've decided, and it's just a warning, a lot of you aren't going to be happy about it, but please try to understand. Ever since I started making games, I wanted to be a world builder, I never wanted to make gimmicky games or things that didn't mean something. I wanted to create experiences that would really have an impact on people. I feel like I got to do that with the first few games, but somehow I feel like I let myself get too dark with this one. Things went sideways, and I look at this game now and I'm unsure of how it will affect people. So then what am I supposed to do? Release something that offends me just to satisfy those who want to play it? Or do I take the time and effort to really craft something that everyone can enjoy? The answer is obvious to me. But I think I have the solution. This is uh, this is the part most of you won't like. I'm going to release the mature version of the game by itself in sections, not as part of the timeline, not as part of the lore. Aww. We'll, we'll see. pick it apart, probably. <laughs> it's probably it's and not, not a bit. And not as part of the story, but just because I promised that I would. I promised a game, and I don't want to be one of those developers who endlessly delays their game's release. Um, I'm going to release the game in chapters. However, not the whole game at once, since it puts a strain on the servers over at GameJolt. It actually looked like Scott Cawthon was concerned about how dark he made Sister Location. He even went so far as to flag the game that he posted on Game Jolt as mature, prompting you to click continue before you can see the game page. A lot of people in the community weren't buying it because of Scott's trolling history, but one of the best moments in the history of FNAF comes from two people who did buy it. So, All right. I mean, so this is legit. Okay. Like, this came from Scott on Steam. Let's do it. This is from his official account, so here it is. This we is a disclaimer. Yeah, da, this, da, 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 this da. might be a mature stream. This, we don't, yeah, apparently... this might be a really mature stream. We just have no idea. What Literally, we're into. Jason has not previewed it. I'm, All right. I'm, dig I'm digging the music. Yeah, let's do this, man. I've, and legitimately, I've been excited about this location, uh, you know, because this was a year in the making. So this is the mature version 
of Sister Location. The real version won't be coming out for another two months. So here it is. This is a preview of it. Okay, so the new... Yeah, cool. Wait, All right. Are you kidding me? Are you, are you effing kidding me? Oh, it was a troll? Are you it was a troll the whole time? Are you kidding oh, me? Oh, we got trolled. Are you kidding me? This is the equivalent of getting Rickrolled on the internet. Are you kidding me? Damn they it. were so good. They Damn were so it! Good. The chat warned us. Damn it! I, they did such a good job. I'm so proud of whoever this troll is. I they did you, like so amazing. No, this, wow. no, this is Scott. This is Scott. <laughs> I, you're proud of effing Scott Coffin oh. for troll. Damn it! That is one of my favorite clips in the history of FNAF, but jokes aside, it really did show how much MatPat cared about the games and was so excited for the new game to come out. They just unfortunately fell victim to one of Scott's many trolls. On October 7th, 2016, the real FNAF sister location was officially released. The community fell in love with the game, despite it leaving us with more questions than answers yet again. The game led you through Circus Baby's entertainment and rental while you had the night shift as a technician. You were being guided by Hand Unit, a talking portable keypad. Once again, this is not a lore video, but the game did tell a pretty compelling story that you had to research for days after the game to fully understand, but it was compelling nonetheless. The game had great voice acting, great jump scares, and even a great twist. The game quickly became a lot of people's favorites in the franchise. Here's a quick speed round. On October 17th, Scott announced that he was making a new custom night for Sister Location. He announced this with a teaser on Scott Games and a post on Steam. He stated that the update would be free and not canon to the main game. On October 22nd, Scott announced that FNAF The Silver Eyes was a number one New York Times bestseller, thanking the community. On October 30th, MatPat released his new Sister Location theory and Scott commented on it on Steam, saying that regardless of what people may agree with or disagree with about the theory itself, I think this was one of his best videos. It was well made, it was entertaining, and he really did find some things that no one else had found yet. Fast forward to November 27th, 2016 when we got a new teaser and release date for the Sister Location Custom Night. It was slated to release December 1st, which was literally a few days away. Then, on December 1st, Sister Location's Custom Night arrived. The Custom Night was in the style of all the FNAF games that came before it, but of course it had its own special twists. The update wasn't as big of a deal as a mainline FNAF release, but people still seemed to really like the update. And as much as Scott said the Custom Night would not be canon, if you got far enough in the game, you would unlock one of the most canon cutscenes in all of FNAF. 2017. On January 17th, 2017, Scott posted a new teaser on FNAFWorld.com announcing that an iOS and Android port of the game was coming soon. FNAF World ended up releasing on Android for one day before it was pulled from the App Store. FNAF World was then never released on iOS. The mobile port of FNAF World seemed to be a stripped down version of the PC game and got a lot of backlash. Scott responded to someone on Reddit and said, guys, I'm sorry, I promise I will never touch this game again. I thought I was doing a good thing, but it was obviously a bad idea. After that, we would never receive any future news or updates about FNAF World ever again. After the release of Sister Location custom night, the community still had the movie to look forward to. On January 31st, 2017, Scott posted an update about the FNAF movie on Steam, saying that the FNAF movie was met with several delays and roadblocks, and as a result, the movie was back at square one. This was not the update we were expecting since it's been almost two years since the movie was announced at this point. But Scott reassured everyone that this was a good thing because he was going to be involved with the movie from day one this time, implying that maybe the studio started making changes to the movie that Scott didn't fully agree with. Two months later, Scott posted his first and last ever tweet the tweet featured a photo of a director's chair with Freddy's name on it, along with Blumhouse Productions in the background. This was pretty good news because Blumhouse is known for making some pretty good horror movies, so FNAF was officially in good hands. ScottGames.com went dark on January 7th and remained that way for over six months, the longest period of time without a Scott Games update since FNAF began. The silence ended when a new teaser was posted on Scott Games and FNAFWorld.com on June 11th, 2017. On FNAFWorld.com, all you could see was eyeballs, similar to babies, but not exactly. No one had any idea what these were teasing. Could there actually be a FNAF 6? The teaser on Scott Games was to promote the newest FNAF book, Five Nights at Freddy's The Twisted Ones. Scott would then update Scott Games throughout the month of June with new teasers for the book leading up to its release on June 27th, 2017. On June 30th, Scott released a long post on Steam with some major updates. He announced that he's been working on a new game, possibly FNAF 6, and that he needs to take a break from the development of the game. He goes on to say that he's a bit burnt out and the expectations to keep making the games better and better have got to him. He said that he was just taking a break and that he'll be back eventually. He then announces that a VR game is on the way and that the FNAF movie is now in safe hands with Blumhouse. He ends the post saying that he hopes we can understand and respect his decision. Most of the community was happy Scott was taking a break since he was working non-stop since 2014, but others in the community did not really like this post and actually thought that he might be trolling. This led to Scott editing his post saying that he'd rather just say the new game is cancelled rather than leaving everyone on hold indefinitely. He also said that he wants to make something more lighthearted to help him relax and that a 
it would be free. The next time we got an update on scottgames.com was for FNAF's third anniversary on August 8th, 2017. Scott, for the second year in a row, showed us some behind the scenes images of him working on the past FNAF games, but this time something was off. Out of the nine images we got, three of them seemed to feature parts of some animatronics that we've never seen before. Maybe Scott was done with his break, or maybe these were just nothing. The community wasn't really sure at the time. The last teaser we got on the anniversary was of the Freddy plushie from FNAF 4. Nothing when you brightened it up, and nothing notable in the source code. Ten days later, on August 18th, 2017, this image dropped on scottgames.com. The image was of the FNAF 2 8-bit Freddy with a rainbow following him. Because it was the FNAF 2 Freddy, people were speculating that Scott was trying to hint that the new game would take place during that era. Two months later, on October 28th, 2017, the 8-bit Freddy teaser was updated to feature three kids standing around him. That's it. On November 8th, 2017, the image changed to Freddy juggling some pizzas around. Still, the community had no idea what Scott was up to. Meanwhile, on FNAFworld.com, the eyes that showed up a while ago have now closed. We ended up getting an update from Scott 18 days later on November 26th, where he said that he was going to make an announcement about a new cast slash crew member on the movie, but it wasn't fully set in stone, so he didn't want to. He also said that he refused to let a full year go by without a new FNAF game, so he's whipping up something fun for us for the holidays. We would soon learn what that was on December 1st, 2017, when Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator was announced on Scott Games. It looked like this was going to be a fun 8-bit styled game from Scott, but some of the community had their doubts and maybe their expectations a little too high. A lot of people thought they were literally getting FNAF 6, but it looks like Scott wasn't trolling this time. On December 3rd, we got another teaser with a countdown to the game. Two days left. The next day, one day left. And on that day, December 4th, 2017, Scott took to Steam to apologize to the community. He saw their response to the teasers and was sorry if he may have overhyped the game. He reassured the community that this was just a fun game and nothing big at all. He ended by saying that he was just going to release the game today instead of tomorrow. So the game released and this is what happened. What the? What the? F what the freak? The freak going on? The biggest memory, of course, is when we thought we were just playing a little 8-bit sprite game feeding pizzas to kids, right? And then the game glitched, and then BAM! Scrap Baby on the interview table with the tape with Henry. Oh my god. If you guys have seen my reaction to that, that's my best memory. Being trolled by Scott and getting a full game, completely free by the way, it was completely free. Seeing Scrap Baby in the interview room, 10 out of 10, best memory, hands down. Scott's fun little game for the holidays ended up being FNAF 6. Scott successfully trolled the community once again. The game was partly a pizzeria simulator and partly a full-on FNAF game. People loved the pizzeria simulator part of the game where you could make money and spend it on upgrading your pizzeria. You could also play some of the mini games that you bought, which actually led us to some of the biggest lore bits we've ever gotten. Each night of the game, you were offered a new animatronic to either throw away or keep. If you kept it, you would have to deal with fending it off once you entered the FNAF part of the game. If you collect all the animatronics and successfully made it to 6 a.m. you unlocked one of the best cutscenes in any FNAF game ever. Connection terminated. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Elizabeth. If you still even remember that name. This game was a joy, and the fan base loved it, especially that ending cutscene. The game gave us a lot of answers to the lore, which is something that fans really have been wanting, but it also left a lot of questions on the table. But in Scott's own words, some things are best left forgotten for now. After the release of Pizzeria Simulator, we didn't really hear much from Scott until February 12th, 2018, when he announced that Chris Columbus would be writing, directing, and producing the FNAF movie. Four days later, on February 16th, 2018, Scott gave another update on Steam titled Future of FNAF Games and Update Ideas. In the post, he said that he's had a lot of good opportunities come and go, mostly because he wanted to finish off the series himself. He was happy with the state of the franchise and how he ended Pizzeria Simulator and announced that if there was going to be another major FNAF game, he wouldn't be the one making it. Some people say that this was the actual moment that Scott retired, but he wasn't done quite yet. He had ideas for an update to Pizzeria Simulator, which featured an ultimate custom night with a lot more characters added to the game. The community responded well to this news, so he edited the post saying he's going to begin work on ultimate custom night and to keep an eye on Scott games to see his progress. And boy did he update Scott Games. 
a lot. Two days later on February 18th, 2018, Scott updated Scott Games for the first time with 40 blank boxes, which meant there were going to be 40 animatronics in Ultimate Custom Night. After this point, Scott uploaded over 65 new teasers to Scott Games in the span of four months. So I hope you'll forgive me for not going over every teaser and telling you the exact day that they released. Over time, the list grew to over 50 animatronics, with Scott updating a Steam post frequently with every animatronic and their exact gameplay mechanics. On May 10th, 2018, Daco uploaded a YouTube video to his channel. Nothing unusual there, he posts mostly every day. Until you clicked on it. This is a message to Scott. <sighs> Scott, I'm giving you 24 hours! In the video, Daco pretended to take four people hostage and demanded that Scott make 50-20 mode easier. Daco did this because he had been trying to make a bet with Scott. If he can beat 50-20 mode in Ultimate Custom Night, Scott has to do an interview with him on his channel. After Daco posted this video, Scott actually responded via a YouTube comment and a Steam post, saying that the bet is on. But if Daco gives up on 50-20 mode, he has to make a FNAF fan game called FANF7. Daco was now more determined than ever to beat 50-20 mode and get that interview. While all of of this was going on, we got the final installment in the FNAF book trilogy, FNAF The Fourth Closet, on June 26, 2018. The next day, on June 27th, Ultimate Custom Night was released for free on Steam, and the race to beat 50-20 mode was on. In the meantime, the game featured more lore than we were expecting, with every single character in the game having voice acting and different cutscenes after progressing in the game. A lot of the voice lines were lore heavy, but some of them were interesting. Q, Mr. Hippo. If you died to this animatronic in the game, he would not only jump scare you, but he would then tell you an over three and a half minute long story that had absolutely nothing to do with the lore, and it was awesome. Hey! My friend, you have met a terrible, terrible demise. But, uh, you know, I, I don't feel too bad about it. <laughs> After all, if, if it weren't from me, it would have just been from someone else, you know? I guess what I'm trying to say. Over on GT Live, MatPet was trying to pick apart the lore of the game, curious about the anime styled cutscenes featured as you progressed. Hey, did what? So, did you get it? So, did you get it? The cutscenes were silly. That's it, they were just silly. Overall, people loved Ultimate Custom Night. It's one of the highest rated FNAF games on Steam with an overwhelming positive score from reviewers. The game was a success and the community was happy. Oh, where was Daco? Uh. Uh. Oh. 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 Ultimate custom night. I think you already know what my favorite memory is, right? Daco ended up beating 5020 mode with a reaction that became one of the biggest memes in the franchise to this day. Daco officially won an interview with Scott Cawthon, the first and only audio interview that he would ever do. Daco was surprisingly not the first one to complete 5020 mode. A YouTuber by the name of Remory completed it a day before Daco on July 8th, 2018, officially becoming, we think, the first ever person to beat 5020 mode. Remory was then followed by Daco on July 9th and DJ Surf on July 10th. The community rallied together to try and get Get this done with DJ uploading tutorials on how to more effectively beat 5020. Uh, seeing Darko cross the finish line was one of my favorite memories from the entire series, though. Not too long before Ultimate Custom Night came out, Darko was in the hospital with a collapsed lung, and I wanted to be sure that he didn't go back to the hospital, so I guess mission accomplished on that one. Previously, Darko didn't have much of a history of finishing the hardest modes, uh, and I mean, I've always seen him as more of the face of the franchise, and he's very personable, and you know, he's great with the community, so um, yeah, that's more of what he focused on, and he's kind of like a stress light type player by nature, but 
He's very capable of beating the hardest modes. On July 9th, Scott congratulated all of the people who have completed 5020 mode, including Remory, Daco, and DJ Stir. The interview was posted on August 8th, 2018, and was a joy to watch. Daco asked some great questions, and Scott gave some great answers. It was really cool to hear the voice of someone who has made such a big impact on so many people's lives. The interview is a great watch, and I recommend going to check it out after this video. I got a lot of information for this video out of that interview, actually. On August 19th, Scott made a long Steam post about all of the upcoming projects planned really related to FNAF. First, he talked about a movie and how he already had a few scripts written. He announced that the story would be based around the first game and that the possible second movie would be based on the second game. Secondly, he said that the VR game is coming along well and that he was creeped out by the demo Steel Studios sent him. Steel Studios is a small game studio based out of California who were set to make the first official FNAF VR game. Scott said that a FNAF AR game is also coming, but it's in its infancy. Lastly, he mentioned that he would like to make a game just for fun for the community. Along the same lines as Update 2 for FNAF World. There were a lot of projects coming and the community was super hyped about the future of FNAF. ScottGames.com stayed dark for nearly eight months until it was updated on March 11th, 2019. A new teaser dropped for the FNAF VR game that Scott was teasing, including some hidden teasers in the source code. The main teaser featured brand new models of some of the animatronics we knew and loved, all mushed together with the words, everything is working as intended in the top left. The teaser featured some hidden text that directly connected back to the lore of the main games, including Remember Jeremy. So it was looking like the VR game was going to be canon. One problem occurred with this new teaser though. It seemed that Steel Wool either unknowingly or knowingly used the likeness of some fan models in the teaser. Scott went to Reddit and announced that he has taken down the teaser and plans to think about where to go from here. On March 25th, 2019, the trailer for FNAF VR Help Wanted was officially released and it looked awesome. The trailer was short and kind of scattered, but it showed us some really cool gameplay that looked like it would be terrifying in VR. We got the official release date for Help Wanted on April 19th, 2019. The game was set to be released on May 21st, 2019. Fast forward to May 16th and FNAF VR has officially been delayed, but not for long. The release date was pushed one week to May 28th just so the studio could polish the game a little bit. Most of the community was accepting of this news considering that Steel Wool Studios was trying to make the game the best it could be. On May 20th, 2019, Scott sent a few select YouTubers an early copy of FNAF VR, encouraging them to notify him of any glitches. At the time, they took that comment at face value, but knowing what we know now, he was memeing. <laughs> Pretty soon, the YouTubers and their audiences were being brought on a new journey through the FNAF universe, a journey that slowly started connecting to the canon of the main lore. The game featured FNAF 1 through 4 with some newly created minigames crafted by Steel Wool Studios. It's funny because the minigames, not the actual FNAF games, became most people's favorite part of the game. In the game, Scott Cawthon became canon, the actual FNAF games themselves became canon, and being able to download your consciousness into a video game became canon. Yeah, don't look for answers from me in this video. <laughs> the game introduced a new but familiar villain, Glitchtrap, who was William Afton, the purple guy, but in digital form. The game eventually released to the public on May 28th, 2019, and even though it was a bit buggy at first, it ended up being a solid entry to the franchise. Steel Wool Studios seemed to be the chosen ones to continue the FNAF lore. Next up was the day that started it all, the beginning of the end, or the beginning of what would be the current day. On FNAF's fifth anniversary, Scott released this teaser on Scott Games, announcing a brand new game that seemed to be set in a mall with brand new animatronics coming in 2020. This was really exciting news because other than the VR game, the community hasn't gotten a proper FNAF game since Pizzeria Simulator back in 2017. The same day, FNAFWorld.com was updated with a new image as well, and it was the number 58. When you brighten the image, you could see some made-up quotes making fun of the idea of this new game, saying things like, probably the worst idea he's ever had, and stopped caring after dream theory. People started piecing together that in FNAF World Update 2, there was a mini-game titled Freddy in Space 57, so it looked like we were getting a sequel to that game. Uh, Scott's much more go with the flow, but he's also kind of in turbo mode sometimes. I think it was 10 days before the... St. Jude Charity stream with Freddy in Space 2 that Scott sent me the first email saying, hey, can you test this? And I was like, yeah? And I was, I was thinking, well, how much time? Like, <laughs> That's going to be very, very, very fast. But the nice part was with that one in particular, with Freddy in Space 2, it was right around Thanksgiving and I had several days that I could take off and I needed to take off of work. So I did and I had a lot of time to devote to that. So it was a bunch of time in a big chunk there all at once trying to get as many builds and cycles done as possible. I tested the N-1 build and then when the stream was, was going on and I saw the, the version number was one above the one that I tested, I was like, oh no, like, oh no. On September 13th, 2019, the first trailer for the AR game that Scott teased a while ago was released and it featured none other than Markiplier. Markiplier was now canon to the FNAF universe. The teaser was awesome and people were really hyped about the game. On September 29th, 2019, FNAFworld.com was updated with
FNAFWorld.com was updated with the official announcement for Freddy in Space 2. On the same day, ScottGames.com was updated with a new teaser for SteelWolf Studios' upcoming game. It was a closer look at what Freddy would look like in the game. There was nothing much to say about it except that it looked like the game was going to be 80s style. On October 11th, 2019, SteelWolf Studios released the official trailer for some Help Wanted DLC. The DLC was Halloween themed and would be called Curse of Dreadbear. The trailer was short and mostly cinematic, but it looked to be a fun update to Help Wanted and the community couldn't wait to see what SteelWolf Studio had in store as far as gameplay and the lore. 12 days later, on October 23rd, FNAF VR Curse of Dreadbear was released. The game was an instant hit. It looked like SteelWolf took what people loved the most from Help Wanted and expanded on it in the DLC. The mini games were so creative and people really had a good time playing them. The game also expanded on the lore from Help Wanted. At the end of the Corn Maze minigame, we got to see a creepy bunny mask hidden in a cellar. You could then use this mask to unlock some secret dialogue at the prize counter. The dialogue hinted that someone was being controlled by Glitchtrap and was set to carry on the legacy that William started when he was fully alive. On November 5th, 2019, ScottGames.com was updated with the same Freddy teaser we saw before. But this time, you could see the silhouette of the bunny mask lady we saw in Curse of Dreadbear. It looked like Steel Wolf Studios was setting up the next villain in the FNAF franchise. On November 16th, it was announced that MatPat was doing a big charity stream for St. Jude and was going to feature Docco, Markiplier, and some other cool creators. He didn't know it yet, but Docco was being flown out to play Freddy in Space 2 with Matt, Pat, and Mark, but the game was going to be programmed where the farther you got in the game, the more money Scott would donate to the stream. And the cap was half a million dollars. The stream is going to be live on December 3rd, 2019. Fast forward nine days to November 25th, 2019, and FNAF AR was officially released. FNAF AR brought some of the animatronics from FNAF home with you. Using AR technology, you could literally fight off animatronics that were invading your home. FNAF AR received several updates over time, adding new characters and skins of the classic animatronics such as Liberty Chica and Toxic Springtrap. A lot of the YouTubers checked out the game and really enjoyed playing it. Overall, at the time, the game had a good reception from the community. On November 30th, Scott Cawthon posted the official trailer for Freddy in Space 2. In the trailer, he promoted the Game Theory Charity stream on December 3rd and showed a bunch of gameplay from the new game. Scott ended up dedicating Freddy in Space 2 to Skylar Jin, a YouTuber who loved FNAF and sadly passed away on October 26, 2019 due to cancer at the age of 12. The Game Theory Charity stream ended up being a success. Mark, Matt, Pat, and Docco ended up winning the whole half a million dollars from Scott's game and collectively raised over $1.3 million for St. Jude. On December 17th, to cap off the year, Steelwell Studios announced their Christmas update to FNAF VR, which ended up being mostly fun cosmetic changes to the game, but also featured a big teaser for their upcoming game that's been teased on Scott Games. In the update, you could actually choose to walk outside of the building. Once outside, you could see a giant mall being built in the distance, which was presumably the mall we were seeing in the Scott Games teasers. It's important for me to say that during this time, a new FNAF book series was being released called Fazbear Frights. The first book was released on December 26, 2019. They were books with three individual stories based on the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise. These stories were not directly tied to the games, but they did help answer some questions from the lore. Once again, this is not a FNAF lore video, but I just thought I'd mention that. Our next teaser from the new game came on March 24th, 2020. The teaser featured a brand new animatronic in the form of an alligator. When you save the image, it's saved as Montgomery. This was our first official look at Monty. The next teaser for the new game came on May 5th, 2020, and it revealed the official title and logo for the game, Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. At this point, there were a ton of new leaks happening, with a calendar featuring the models of the new animatronics on the front, and Funko leaking their new Security Breach figures. So everyone already knew the title, but it was nice to see it in HD on Scott Games. On June 11th, 2020, we got our next teaser for Security Breach. This time, it featured a security guard with long blonde hair and green eyes. The teaser had the word protect in purple at the bottom. A lot of people assumed that this was going to be the person helping us in Security Breach. On August 7th, 2020, we got our first look at Vanny, the bunny from FNAF VR Curse of Dreadbear. You can see the full homemade suit and a giant knife being held in her right hand. She also is surrounded by TVs, just like when Freddy was surrounded with TVs in the trailer for Help Wanted. The word obey is at the bottom of the teaser, which confirmed that this was the same person from Curse of Dreadbear. We got two more teasers for Security Breach the next day on FNAF's sixth anniversary. They were a similar style as the Freddy poster, but now with Roxanne and Chica. 14 days later on August 21st, 2020, Scott Cawthon took to Reddit to announce something huge. In the Reddit post, he announced something called the Fazbear Fanverse Initiative. With this initiative, Scott was going to be personally funding a select few of the most popular FNAF fan games, including One Night at Flumpties, Five Nights at Candies, The Joy of Creation, Pop Goes, and a new game by Fiznom called FNAF Plus. This was an amazing moment for the community and the gaming world in general. The creator of one of the most popular indie games ever is personally funding a handful of fan games and letting them be a part of the FNAF multiverse. This was unheard of and a very welcome surprise to the community. If you want to learn more about that, I have a video on my channel called Why You Should Be Excited About the Fazbear Fanverse. I recommend you go check it out. Then, on September 16th, 2020, the entirety of the
the FNAF community lost their mind when this trailer was shown during the PlayStation State of Play event. What's out there? This is not FNAF. That's not FNAF. No. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh no! Oh my god! People could not believe how good the game looked. Daco didn't even recognize it was a FNAF game until halfway through. I also remember losing my mind at this trailer and thinking about how far FNAF has come over the years, or for you, the beginning of this video. This was a giant moment for FNAF, and I'd say one of the biggest in FNAF's history. On November 17th, 2020, Security Breach got delayed for the first time. Scott went to Reddit to announce that the game would now be coming out in 2021 and not 2020. He explained that the game got way too big and they just need more time to finish it. He said it could have been out by Christmas, but they would have to cut content and he wasn't willing to do that. The community responded well to this because the game already looks so good and they wanted it to be the best game possible. Three days later, that bad news was overshadowed by some great news about the FNAF movie. On November 20th, Scott made a long Reddit post titled Bad News About the FNAF Movie. In this post, he went through a bunch of failed script ideas for the FNAF movie, including one called Plushies Take Manhattan. The post ended with a script called Mike, referring to Michael Afton, which was William Afton, the purple guy's son. This ended up being the screenplay they chose and he announced that they are going to start filming in spring of 2021. This was giant news for the FNAF community because this movie has been on and off since April of 2014. So it was so nice to finally have some good news about the project. In January of 2021, it was announced that Steel Wool Studios was going to be attending an NVIDIA event where they would show progress on Security Breach. This was a public event, but you would have to sign up for it in order to watch it. People were hyped to see some new content from the game despite it being delayed two months prior. The event happened on January 12th, 2021, and it was in the style of a PlayStation State of Play. Play event. The trailer featured some slow pans of some familiar and some new areas of the mall we haven't seen yet. A fair amount of the community was confused slash unsatisfied with what we got, some saying that the game looked nothing like what we got in the first teaser trailer. Scott saw this reception and went to Reddit to clarify that the new footage was meant to just be a tech demo showing off new parts of the mall and that an actual trailer 2 would be coming out in March. And the trailer actually came sooner than that, on February 25th, 2021, once again during the PlayStation State of Play. The trailer once again blew everyone away, showing us new gameplay and cinematic shots from the game. We got our first look at the 3D models for the four main animatronics, the new Sun and Moon animatronics, and Vanny. The trailer ended with the hand of a mystery animatronic. The hand looked extremely similar to a nightmare animatronic, but not 100%. Some people thought that the hand might actually belong to William Afton, brought back from the dead and into his physical form once more. On April 28th, 2021, Scott once again went to Reddit to announce that Security Breach was being delayed. He said the game would be moved from early 2021 to late 2021 and explained that it would be worth it. Scott went on to say, I know it's disappointing, but I didn't want you all to walk away empty-handed, so I made something for the community, with a link to a game called Security Breach Fury's Rage. The main gameplay was basically a FNAF Street Fighter game featuring the main four animatronics from Security Breach and some weird enemies, some that we've seen from FNAF AR and some brand new. The community loved this game from Scott and couldn't wait for Security Breach because it was looking to be the biggest FNAF game yet. In June 2021, after some information about Scott's political donations went viral on Twitter, he decided it was best for him to officially retire from game development. In his final Scott Games update, he announced that someone else would be taking up the mantle for him in the future and that he wanted to go back to making games for his kids and taking care of his family. On FNAF's 7th anniversary, August 8th, 2021, we got another piece of artwork from Steel Wool Studios, Daco's brand Hex announcing that they were making their own FNAF plushies, and we got a 13 minute long short film for FNAF Plus, one of the games in the Fazbear Fanverse initiative. This short film was an incredible cinematic look at what we'd be getting in the FNAF 1 remake slash reimagining. On September 1st, 2021, Steel Wool Studios suspiciously tweeted that their website was down and that it'd be back up soon. Once it was back up, a link to a separate website called securitybreachtv.com was added. The website looked to be the new hub for FNAF Security Breach teasers, featuring a FNAF-styled office with a giant screen in the middle. Six days later, on September 7th, 2021, securitybreachtv.com updated and now featured a video that you could activate by pushing that Freddy button on the desk. The video was a Hanna-Barbera-themed cartoon featuring Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy. The cartoon showed the characters going on a road trip in a pizza delivery service van, only to be confronted by Foxy along the way. Foxy ends up getting revealed to be an animatronic while the other characters are in shock. The video ends with a slithering thing going across the screen and a small teaser for a release date below the Security Breach logo. Security Breach's marketing was now in full swing. Steel Wool would release three more of these videos over the next six weeks, each teasing a new character in the upcoming game. These videos all led to the final trailer being revealed at the PlayStation State of Play event on October 27th. This final trailer was miles beyond what anyone was expecting from the game. It featured featured cutscenes that had incredible animation, gameplay that looked great for the most part, and the official release date, December 16th, 2021. But most importantly,
finally evolved, it featured MUSIC MAN! People were more hyped than ever for the game. It looked like this game was going to change FNAF forever. Three days after the trailer, on October 30th, 2021, Docco held a charity livestream where Steelville Studios sent him some new teasers for Security Breach to reveal when new donation goals were hit. These teasers included posters from the game, most notably some Fredbear's Family Diner posters. This made everyone curious about how the first ever FNAF pizzeria would play a role in the game. Also, during the charity stream, the first game from the Fazbear Fanverse Initiative, One Night at Fonty's 3, was released. Docco then played it live on stream. And a few days before the game came out, Docco actually got to interview Steelwool Studios on his YouTube channel on December 12th, 2021. On December 16th, 2021, Security Breach was finally released and the game was huge. The game ended up being bigger than any of us were expecting. The game starts with a cutscene that we saw pieces of in the trailer. The cutscene ended with Freddy glitching out and falling on stage. He then wakes up in his green room with Gregory inside his stomach hatch. Thus begins a journey where Freddy tries to help Gregory escape the mall, trying to avoid Vanny, the night guard, and the other animatronics that are after him. The game looked great, but it didn't come without some bugs. Or a lot of bugs. Well, last parting gift, I guess. I'll try to get in there. Whoa! Shove a beak inside of you, and you are going to be able to talk better. You... The bursting. Okay, look at that arm there. Uh, do I... What? What a... <laughs> While the game did come with some bugs, it still had a mostly positive reaction from fans. The game was pretty divisive as far as the story was concerned. It added more questions than answers and was fairly vague about why and how things were happening. This led to a lot of people posting and talking about their theories online, including one of the biggest people on YouTube, MatPat. On February 19th, 2022, MatPat held another FNAF Theory livestream on the Game Theorist channel with a few other YouTubers, including Daco, Tetrabit Gaming, Tom and Dan from Game Theory, Super Horror Bro, Bandit Games, and me. During the stream, we discussed our theories about what the heck happened in Security Breach, with MatPat slightly hoping that Steel Wool or Scott would start giving us some hints during the stream, just like back in 2015. But no hints ever came. It looked like we were on our own this time to try and figure out the lore of this game. Overall, Security Breach was a nice addition to the franchise. The bugs were annoying sometimes, but a lot of them made the game funnier and speedrunners had a field day with them. The game birthed a bunch of new memes that blew up all over TikTok and some amazing cosplay from the community. After a few months, Steel Wool Studios started making updates to the game, adding features that were meant to be there on launch, and fixing a bunch of the bugs. And here we are today. The FNAF movie never ended up filming in spring of 2021, but Jason Blum is continually reassuring us on Twitter that it's still coming. FNAF is getting its own pizza delivery service. There are over 25 FNAF books at this point, with a new series called Tales from the Pizzaplex currently being released. The Fazbear Fanverse initiative is still in full swing with the recent release of Pop Goes Arcade on Steam. Daco is creating his own line of FNAF plushies with his brand Hex. The Living Tombstone released their first FNAF song in years with This Comes From Inside, and Steelwool Studios officially announced free DLC for Security Breach coming out in 2023. FNAF started as Scott's final project before giving up game development for good. He took the bad reviews he was getting and ran with them, creating one of the biggest game franchises in the world. And eight years later, it's still going strong. This was the entire history of Five Nights at Freddy's. Thanks for watching.